So they gave me a, this thing, but I like to sit down when, when I do this. I've done, uh, I've done about five or six of these now, but only one for this book, because this book is newer. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to thank the Twig and uh, the staff for, for hosting me again. This is my, my second reading here at the Twig. The first was for uh, my first book, Raw Thoughts, which is completely different than this. Um, <laughs> Edna has a copy of it. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for coming as well. Thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned, I've done five or six. The first one I did was in New York City at Poets House in Lower Manhattan, which is the like the premier place in New York City to do a book reading. And so it was like baptism by fire. And, uh, you know, I, I tried to memorize what I wanted to say and, and prepare. And, 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 you know, at the end of the day, I put my notes aside and, and I just, you know, did what uh, came naturally. Um, and that seemed to work, but one thing that I've noticed um, via the questions that come afterwards is that um, the audiences aren't really interested in hearing you read from the book, right? Um, instead, they, they want to know what your inspiration was, where did the book come from, you know, how did you come up with these ideas? Um, did you insert any of your own experience, you know, from life into the book or, or, or the characters? Questions like that. So I'm going to spend most of my time uh, uh, kind of answering those questions up front with respect to, to devolution. Um, I'll, I will read a little bit from the book, a very sh short chapter uh, near the beginning. It doesn't really give anything away, um, but gives you a sense for um, the mind of the main character. Um, and that's important, I think, because um, this isn't just a spy thriller. It's a psychological spy thriller. And uh, what I didn't want to do was to put a book out there that was a cliche, you know, spy thriller. Um, I wanted the main character to have some real depth and to have a unique mind um, that really only the reader has insight to. Uh, and the other characters don't really know what's going on in, in his head. Um, but first, uh, r let me get to, you know, the, the catalyst, right? So what, where did this book come from? And, and the, the, um, the catalyst for this book was actually a poem that I wrote in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And I'll explain, you know, why it's the catalyst, but first let me read you the poem, okay? <clears throat> it's called Stupid. And yes, this poem is in Raw Thoughts, but not the original version, which I'm going to read to you. Stupid chanting, I can't sleep. Stupid donkey, stupid geep. Stupid crazy hospital czar. Stupid Rick and stupid jar. Stupid ladas everywhere. Stupid curfew, just not fair. Stupid fruit drink made me ill. Stupid dumb malaria pill. Stupid meals with stupid meat. Stupid people in the street. Stupid drivers, stupid roads. Stupid trucks with stupid loads. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, that's not a very elegant or... <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you. <laughs> and the, the bottom line is, I wrote that out of, to have fun. Um, I was in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, at the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, as my final deployment before retiring from the Air Force, I was working as a, a liaison for uh, uh, U.S. Air Forces in Africa at the U.S. Embassy in, in Addis. And my, my job there was to kind of grease the rails for a predator, a drone base that we had um, in the southern part of Ethiopia. So I was working with the Ethiopian government to make sure that everything was, 
being done um, uh, in, a, in a manner that, that didn't hinder our operation. And um, I, I had already written 50 pages of devolution when I went there. And my thought was, this is what I'm going to do in my spare time. I'm going to continue working on that book. And I, and I, I, I started to. And I got frustrated because I felt like um, I wasn't, I just wasn't able to uh, uh, develop the characters, um, especially the main character, in the way that I wanted to. I, I wasn't a writer yet. You know, I was doing this for the first time, and I knew it wasn't good enough. And so I put it aside and, and wrote this poem one day because I was bored, shared it with my colleagues who know what that meant, right? So, uh, for instance, a geep. Mm -hmm. No one knows what a geep is, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, there are sheep or goats, no one really knows which, in Ethiopia that look like a cross between the two, and so we call them geep, right? Um, Lada's everywhere. Lada's are old Russian, tiny Russian-made cars, and they are driven everywhere in Ethiopia, and they're held together with wire and, and uh, and, and tape, uh, but but this is what all the taxi drivers drive. And, um, you know that the, the the trucks are stacked, you know, 40 feet high with whatever they're carrying around, and everything looks dangerous. And it's the most dangerous country in Africa to drive in. And so, this was funny for me and the folks I shared it with. This poem, and I got something out of that. I thought, well, that was fun. It was fun to do, and so I wrote some more. Um, and then my, my my poetry started to become kind of serious, right? I started writing about serious things like, you know, loss and despair and love and um, <clears throat> the difficulties of life and joy and really a whole spectrum of things. Uh, and long story short, I ended up with uh, around 200 poems, and um, because of uh, the advice that I got from a friend of a friend who happens to be, um, her name is Cheryl Nelms, and she's the most prolific poet in the state, in the history of the state of Texas. She's published 21 books of poetry. Um, she got her hands on, on my poems and said, you need to continue writing. Some of these are pretty good. And um, so that is where my first book came from, and and that's this is raw thoughts, and um, it, you know I'm not here to talk about raw thoughts, but uh, it's a compelling and mindful fusion of poetry and black and white film photography. So that I have a a, a friend who is a professional photographer, and, and uh, so we paired photographs with the poems um, to enhance. The overall reading experience. Um, and it goes from very dark, you know, so the front cover is kind of dark, to very light at the end. Um, so the final poem is a complete opposite uh, emotionally um, than the first poem, which is very dark, you know. Um, and it got published. And so I thought, wow. Uh, I can't believe I published this book. And, and a few months later, I thought, well, what about this idea for a novel? You know, maybe I can, maybe I can get that published. And so I took those 50 pages, hadn't looked at it in four or five years, uh, yeah, about four or five years, uh, sent it to my publisher along with a two-page synopsis um, that explained the complete plot for Devolution and the two sequels because it's a trilogy. It, was, it had always been a trilogy in my mind. Uh, the second book, which I'm working on now, is called Evolution. And the third book is called Revelation. Um, so I sent that, those two files to him, and about two weeks later, he sent me a three book contract, which <laughs> blew me away, uh, with the caveat that I had to finish it in order to release the book in October. So he sent me the contract in February 2019. I had 50 pages that I hadn't looked at in five years. So I really couldn't remember what was in it. Um, 
And I had to finish the book by uh, the end of, really, uh, the middle of September in order to, to have it released by October. Um, and I ended up having to go back and kind of rewrite a lot of what I had already written in those first 50 pages because, remember, I wasn't really a writer when I first started. But having written all that poetry, and really, which is hard to do, writing poetry is a lot harder to do than writing, for me at least, for, than writing uh, prose. Um, all of that poetry, you know, do, writing all that poetry really made me a better writer. And so uh, I was able to actually uh, provide that depth of character um, and, and to write scenes in a much more professional sounding way. Um, and so it kind of came more naturally to me. And by the time I had reached the halfway point of writing the book, I got excited um, because I had done most of the research. I had done a lot of the hard parts of trying to, you know, figure out where to put the cliffhangers and, and you know, when to kill this character off and, 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 you know, all of these things that are supposed to surprise a reader in a spy thriller, right? Um, it's supposed to be exciting and, you know, there's supposed to be mystery involved and cliffhangers and things like that. Um, so, I'll go ahead and, I said that it is in the book, um, I'll, I'll read Stupid as it is in the book, so you can see how it changed, right? The first one only made sense to me and a few other people. Um, obviously, I couldn't put that in the book as it was. Um, this is how it is in the book. Uh, stupid noises, I can't sleep. Stupid counting, stupid sheep. Stupid breakfast I can't eat. Stupid eggs with stupid meat. Stupid drivers, stupid roads, stupid trucks with stupid loads. Stupid work, I hate my job. Stupid Amy, stupid Bob. Stupid people in my face, stupid people every place. Stupid luck that just won't last. Stupid future, stupid past. It's still a very simple book. There isn't much there. Um, and it is the most simple poem in Raw Thoughts. But I included it because of, you know, the, the fact that it was the, um, it was the catalyst to every, you know, all of my writing so far. Um, and while that's the catalyst, that doesn't mean it's the genesis. It doesn't mean it's the inspiration. And, you know, to get back to one of the original questions, well, you know, how do you write a spy thriller if you're not a spy? You know, uh, do you do research or, or something like that? And um, it would help to give you a, a, some of you get some of you know very m m know me very well, uh, so, some others less. But um, to give you a brief a brief overview of, of my uh, experience, um, I was a, a tactical airlift pilot. I flew the, the C-130 Hercules uh, in various places around the world and in combat. After that, uh, I became a test pilot. Um, so I did uh, developmental flight, flight test, uh, flight testing out of two different locations, one at Lockheed Martin Skunk Works in Palmdale, California, and then at a little known test, uh, flight test base up the street in Waco, Texas. Um, that was the first half of my Air Force career, flying. Um, the second half was all international affairs and diplomacy and like that. So I worked at the Pentagon for four years, essentially as a glorified arms dealer, uh, working with foreign embassies to get them to buy American, right? Uh, to increase interoperability between our Air Force and NATO members and other uh, countries. Um, uh, after that, I went uh, to the U.S. Embassy in uh, Berlin, Germany. Hey, I'm <laughs> Thanks for coming. There's a camera right behind your head, by the way. You might want to move. No, uh, what good people behind me. Uh, all right, I'll stand up. <laughs> um, and so this was um, this was a job that kind of gave me a taste of what's in the book, right? So I was working for the Defense Intelligence Agency, 
which is the defense kind of equivalent of the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, although the human intelligence that I worked in um, was not clandestine, right? So the CIA uh, has clandestine work that they do. Um, in other words, it's black, it's not acknowledged, um, it, no one uh, will uh, acknowledge that uh, an operation exists. It's, it wasn't quite like that. Uh, but I did you know, work peripherally with the CIA. I worked at the US Embassy, I worked with the State Department. Uh, and when I was in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia as a liaison for, uh, for the Air Force, um, the, the, uh, they were undermanned um, at the attache office. And so I had kind of an additional duty to help out again as, um, as an attache, although I wasn't officially an attache. So I was just helping out the office. Um, so that's the extent of my experience in that area. Um, the rest of it's research. Um, so, you know, when you, when you read, um, you know, some of the details about uh, the activities that, that are going on, uh, you know, uh, so, some of that is, you know, those are things that I had to look up or, or, or read because, you know, I was never um, cloak and dagger type of, uh, I never had that type of job. Um, so, can I borrow your book? <laughs> Sometimes I may have one up here. Um, so on, on the back of the book, uh, this synopsis is, Michael Dolan is a stoic perfectionist and former spe special operations pilot working a staff job at the Pentagon when he is approached by the CIA with an improbable request to help prevent impending terrorist attacks in Europe. As his deep cover role in Operation Excise evolves, Dolan finds that of all the demons he must prevail against, the most terrible are from within. Um, so there's a big kind of hint on the back of the book that there's something going on with him personally that is important to the story. And the title itself, um, it really hints at that as well. Devolution, this isn't about society devolving or um, you know, security, uh, you know, European security or US security devolving. This is about the main character devolving. Um, and the unique thing about it is while there are clues, you know, the CIA team that Michael Dolan is working with, they don't really get it, what he's dealing with. Um, and the bottom line is he is pulled in as a non-traditional asset. So he's not trained as a spy. He's pulled in by the CIA because of past uh, associations, colleagues of his, when he was going to college at the Sorbonne in Paris. One of those colleagues ha has, they think, strong ties to a, uh, a, uh, a terrorist group and there is there are indicators that say that that group might be planning something uh, against US people or places like the US Embassy in Paris um, and then there are other factors involved that uh, in the book that kind of prevent the United States from collaborating with the French as, as, as much as they would like um, in order to try, to try to root this out. And so uh, the organization that he gets involved with, is, it's called uh, Scalpel, and they get involved when situations like this exist. The, the United States determines that uh, our interests are be, going to be negatively affected in some radical way, there is no good option to work with the host government, and so we're gonna go in and do it ourselves, which is against international law and, and, and things like that. And so, scalpel doesn't exist, right? And so he gets pulled into that operation. Um, getting back to what makes him, or what makes the book unique, right? The, the depth of the main character. Um, 
there, there was a tragedy in his life when he was in Paris going to the Sorbonne University. A terrible thing happened, and um, he's thrust right back into Paris, right, to work to associate with some of the people that were there and part of that tragedy. And they know this, um, but he's also a very stoic, strong, intelligent person. He had a lot of the typical characteristics that you find in a spy, he has those naturally. Uh, and one of the most important is nerves of steel, right? You have to be able to, to lie and have everyone think that you're telling the truth. Uh, you can't start shaking or get red or start sweating. I mean, you have to have total control of yourself um, in all situations, even when it's dire. Um, and he can do that. Um, but the reason he can do that so well is also part of the reason that he, his character devolves during, uh, during the course of his involvement in this operation. Uh, he's very, uh, uh, he compartmentalizes extremely well, but he compartmentalizes everything, right? And so he, I don't wanna give too much away, but he, he probably lacks empathy. Um, and so when, when someone lacks empathy to, to a strong degree, they're not affected emotionally uh, as much, right? And so while people think he's stoic, in fact, he probably has some issues that he needs to work on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I, I pulled some of that from myself because this is how I kind of used to be. Not to the extreme degree that the character uh, has this problem, but uh, you know, I, I, I did have this problem myself. And uh, so that the inner workings of his mind are, are kind of an extrapolation of what I believe to be um, parts of my own prior uh, mental state. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, in the end, um, everything kind of works out. I'm not going to give anything away, um, but um, it's sort of a happy ending, but it's not an ending, right? There is another book, it's called Evolution. Um, Evolution is, um, you know, picks up kind of the, the loose ends. There, there are loose ends at the end of this book. Um, and, and then runs with them. So there are things that are left kind of unexplained and you know, you, you feel like, well, we didn't really you know, get enough from this character or understand what was going on over there. That's because you know, there, there are two more books. The, in evolution, um, again, the title is representative of where the character, the main character's go. Um, and so what happens at the end of the first book? Uh, there's something big that happens at the end that um, kind of acts as the catalyst for uh, the main character to kind of fix those issues uh, that, that he's had for a while and then to start to evolve, right, to get better. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, the, the uh, it's an, it is still a spy thriller, right? He's, he's back with the CIA in the second book. Um, but the second book, I wanted to be grander. I wanted it to be bigger. I didn't want it to just be another terrorist plot or something. And so I spent the last um, month, month and a half, trying to figure out how to, how to work in a state actor, right? To have some state-sponsored something. In, in this book and, and, uh, and I figured it out. And I figured it out in a really cool way and I'm really excited about it because it's, it's, it's gonna come at you sideways and you're gonna be like, what? Um, and uh, so it's pretty cool. And um, you know, the threat is bigger in the second book. And then the third book uh, is still just uh, bullet points in my head. But um, anyway, with that, um, I would like to just read a little bit from the book. And um, again, this, where I'm reading from is, I'll keep standing, where I'm reading from is um, 
on page 77. So it's, it's after the CIA has approached Michael Dolan and he's agreed to help them out and he's had some training and some, and some uh, uh, indoctrination and, and he's getting ready to go on his mission. Um, and he's talking with his handler who is named Lauren. Lauren was standing near a fountain wearing a grayish plaid wool skirt and a white ruffled silk blouse. She looks different, thought Dolan. Her red hair was pulled back into a ponytail, not as pretty, more professional. She's probably worried about how prepared I am. Good afternoon, Lauren, he said with a nod. Good afternoon. She shook his hand quickly and they both sat down. The location was quite different this time, a small park in Crystal City, just south of the Pentagon. He noted the background noise of water splashing in the fountain, no doubt, to cover their conversation. Though it probably couldn't get more public than this, the abundant greenery largely screened their position from commuters as they walked to and from the Virginia Railway Express Station. Your ticket is inside. She handed him a large navy blue canvas bag with handles. It looked like something he might take to the beach. There was also a folder with information pertaining to your hotel in Paris. It'll be a few weeks before the State Department is able to find you a proper apartment. Contact information for the language school, information about the U.S. Embassy, and a separate file with quite a bit about your job, they are all in there, and your passport with a three-year visa. She reached into a purse. Here is your iPhone and the, the encryption card. The micro SD card was inserted into a dongle, the other end to be plugged into the lightning port of his phone. A piece of scotch tape kept, kept the card secure. Thomas had showed him how to use it. Use it as if it were your own. Remember to take it with you everywhere you go. Again, it's your lifeline. I cannot emphasize that enough. Always keep the card safely hidden. Please tell me you understand. It's important, okay? Um, the dongle and the card, it's a, it's a way of encrypting a conversation, basically. Um, and you can pull it out and plug it in. He took the phone and the white dongle, looked at them briefly, and placed them inside the blue bag. I understand, and you have nothing to worry about, he assured her. <coughs> okay. She crossed her hands on her lap and looked at him with a thoughtful gaze. Michael, I have to say I'm surprised how easily you've agreed to do this. I'll be honest, I'm curious about what's going on in your head right now. I know you have no immediate family besides your parents, and it's relatively easy for you to just pick up and move, but I expected you to be hesitant. I mean, in the spectrum of opportunity that's available to you, this is extreme. It's radical and there are many unknowns. Yes, we've done what we can to make it easier for you, but I would, would have expected you to ask more questions. I'd like to know what you feel about all of this personally before you go. You haven't said much at all about Sharif. I would be overwhelmed to find out a good friend of mine might be involved with something like this. He was hard to read and carried himself with a casual stoicism that was rare, as if he could, uh, as if he could be professional, genuine, and situationally aware without ever giving a hint about his own opinions, feelings, or concerns. It was impressive, or it could be sociopathic. She hoped that wasn't the case. Dolan thought about it for a moment. It makes sense to me that you're concerned. However, I don't think there's anything to be worried about. As you pointed out, I have nothing keeping me here. And though you may perceive that I'm underwhelmed by the whole situation, I can assure you that's because I thought this through to what I would describe as an extreme degree. I've weighed the positives and the negatives, and I've considered the impact of all of it on my life in general. I've been quite objective about it. In the end, I determined it's an opportunity that will benefit me more in the long run than it may appear. More important than that, this gives me the opportunity to serve my country in a different way, a direct way. I've missed being the tip of the spear. And frankly, I'm tired of strategic planning and relationship building. Those things are important and I do them well, but I'm not passionate about them. I'm fully on board. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't wanna, it's, it's more of that uh, for the next few pages. Um, but just to give you kind of an insight into uh, a little bit into the in mind of the, of the character. Um, and, I, you know, I wanted to read something exciting for you, but I, I, there's, I, 
feel like I'm giving something away if I, if I do that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, so he's, he's read the whole thing. So before, before you, you ask me questions, I have a question for you. Yeah. So you've read the book. What did you think about it? What struck you? Um, was there anything that um, you thought was different? I'm, you know, I'm standing up here telling a bunch of people that haven't read the book yet that it's different, right? And why it's different. Do you agree with what I said? Yeah, I, I, I read a lot of spy novels. And so, you know, everybody's got their own character, like Zelda and Glenn and all. And, uh, and they get into their characters. I thought this character uh, was a very complex character. But from him, he seemed to be leading it. For me, it might have been, you know, what do I do? What do I do next? You know, whatever. But he was so complex that, that, that it was easy to him. And I guess it's because of the uh, compartmentalization. Yeah. And I was also, uh, it was a challenge to me to, you know, how you like, you like to think ahead of the character, <laughs> but, uh, I would question something, and then then I would get the answer later. And yeah. again, it was a complex decision that he made. And uh, but I, I I thought it was really good. I think he developed the character really well. And I think I told Marty this that right after I read it. Like, it was one big part about when he's revealing everything. I really like the dream. The dream. The dream yeah. yeah. I mean, I. I related with it. Actually, I, I think I read it twice, <laughs> but I, I, uh, I related with it. Yeah. That, so he's, he's there's some there are a few, uh, a few places in the book where the main character has a recurring dream, and the dream changes a little bit each time, and you kind of wonder maybe the first time around, and maybe even the second time around, you know. What, what does it mean for the book? What does it mean for the plot? Uh, what does it mean for the main character? And that becomes fully revealed at the end um, and gets tied into, um, you know, the, the, uh, the kind of the epiphany that the main character has at the end. And um, so that was, that was part of um, that. I liked being able to write that into the book. And there were a couple other parts that are, were similar. Um, there's another character named Per Obertin, uh, where he has kind of a philosophical discussion with this retired Catholic priest. And um, these, were, these, are all, these are all scenes that you don't typically find in a spy novel because it slows the book down. Um, and even my publisher told me, he's like, when, I, when he first read it, he's like, I've read it three times, I think it's slowing down too much in a few, in a few places. And uh, I was like, I'm not, I'm not cutting those parts out. I didn't tell him. I'm like, all right, you, you think about it some more and you get back with me. He had, his, he had another editor read it as well and then he came back to me. He's like, no, we're keeping it all because now we get it and this is what makes the book unique and it's really good. So I was like, <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, questions from yeah, you? Question. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, looking back to when you first started writing, mm -hmm. you started with uh, poems and some uh, hefty um, topics. You know, like suicide, and yeah. death, and despair. Sure. Did you find that writing those poems then helped you develop some of the psychological aspects of the characters in Demolition? Absolutely, the absolutely, yeah. So the main character is the most developed character, obviously, um, has the most depth and it is complex and almost to the detriment of the other characters. Um, but I don't see that as a negative, right? Because it really makes the reader kind of focus in on his mind and, and, and what's going on in, in his head. And, uh, you know, I'll get back to, go back to what I said before, that I think that not only was I able to write a better novel because I 
wrote poetry in general, right? And prior <coughs> requires you to do a lot of thinking, thinking yeah. right? Because you've got rhyme and meter and imagery, and you know the and imagery the is huge. Emotional aspect too of it. Yes, but then that's what you're getting at, right? The emotional aspect, the um, the emotions of the main character, and and absolutely, yeah. So that def definitely uh, had a big impact, and. Um, <coughs> So I'll pass this around. So these these are the, the covers for the uh, the two sequels, mm -hmm. Evolution and Revelation. And uh, all three were shot back in New Hampshire. My good friend Scott Hussey, who is the photographer for Rothox, and for the sequel to Rothox, Coda, which will come out this year, um, before actually uh, before Evolution comes out. This this book is going. Um, he did the he shot the three covers for each of these books. So. But something else about the book, I, uh, I never knew the word devolution. <laughs> that was a new word to me. Not so many people <laughs> use it in everyday <laughs> language. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to look it up. <laughs> uh, so it, good. Yeah, and you know I was distraught to find after uh, you know. Trying to Google my my own books on, not Google, but you know, find them on uh, like Amazon. Um, there are about I don't know twenty other books titled Devolution, <laughs> right? And there is another uh, trilogy that is Devolution, Evolution, and thank God not Revelation, <laughs> right? But their third book was Revolution. And I actually had people say, "Well, why don't you why don't you go devolution, evolution, revolution?" revolution. And and my my response was always, "It's too it sounds cliche, you know." Yeah. And oh, by the way, the third book, Revelation, kind of refers to the 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 book in in the Bible, right, where a lot of bad things happen. Yeah. And that's yeah, the third book is supposed to be. You know, if evolution is a grander in scope and, and, and then devolution, revolution is that much more. A revelation is that much more. Any other questions? I'm, yes, go ahead. I was just curious. You said the uh, publisher put a, a time limit on you. How many words a day did you have to write to, to make the Words a day. So I think when I was done, it was around 95,000 words. Um, and so I was writing basically a page a day to get from February to, uh, to uh, the end of or middle of September to get the book out with, you know, 310 pages or so. And um, right now I'm about um, 60 pages into the sequel. So I'm ahead of schedule, right? I'm at, I only had 50 pages in February of last year I've already got 60. I should have about 100 by the time February rolls around. So my my hope is to get this book done earlier so I can spend a lot of time refining it. Because I'll tell you what, I, there were three weekends in a row where all I did was work on fixing everything in that book. My final, uh, the final draft that I sent to my editor had, this is the final draft. 600 changes. 600, yeah, he loved me. I'm like, I'm sending you the final draft now. By the way, <laughs> there are 600 changes you have to make. <laughs> so. Yes, Mike. Tell me about your transition when you leave him, get ready to leave the end of this career, coming up to civilian life, being what you are at this point in your life. What was the tilting point for you, sitting down, getting into your own mind, and drafting the first book that you did and the second one? I guess what I'm trying to find out is what was the most inspirational point that led, led you into where you're at today. Yeah, so, uh, I, I, I really liked working uh, as an attaché. Um, I liked the work. 
My master's degree is in international affairs. I speak French, my German is so-so. Um, you know, I always saw myself as a international, you know, having some sort of a career that was international in, in some way. Um, and, um, you know, I did a whole lot of other things instead. <laughs> You know, I, I was a pilot and, and I eventually found my way into international affairs in the Air Force. But, um, you know, when I, when I retired, um, you know, my family and I, we wanted to kind of stay here. And uh, the international focus here in San Antonio is very southward, right? Uh, I don't speak Spanish. I don't understand a whole lot about uh, Latin America and, and South America. Um, you know, my, my focus has always been West Europe. Um, and so I ended up taking a job in, uh, with Xerox and IT. And uh, thank God for the World Affairs Council of San Antonio, right? Armin uh, Bogdanian is, is our executive director. Um, and thanks for coming, Armin. Um, because uh, you know, I, I serve on the board and uh, it allows me to kind of get a flavor for, for, you know, keep my fingers in that. Um, but at the time, I didn't even know about the World Affairs Council, right, back then. And um, I had always had a really eclectic um, life. You know, I did a lot of different things. I didn't follow the path that the Air Force told me to follow. I, I did things kind of differently. And um, I saw, you know, uh, I saw this maybe writing as, yet another uh, way to, to do something interesting that I hadn't done before. And, um, you know, I had tried playing the piano, was not was no good at it. I had tried painting. I mean, I went out and bought all the, all, you know, canvases and paintbrushes and charcoal and, you know, I, I tried it all and I wasn't very good. And um, I had it in my mind, I feel like I'm an artist in some way. Um, and I, by the way, don't ask me to sing. That's the worst <laughs> talent, if I had no talent at all there. Um, but it turned out to be writing. I knew I could write. You know, I'd written a lot of things at the Pentagon, you know, but they were all letters and <laughs> reports and things like that. But, you know, I did those pretty well. Um, what I didn't know is, could I write creatively? And because uh, I had never had that type of education. And it turns out, um, I can do it at least halfway decent. So. Matthew. You, you know, I was looking for what you were saying about painting mm -hmm. and music. Uh, is that not part of writing? I mean, the end result is uh, painting and music. Yeah, no, that's it, listen, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. You're, you're creating an image yeah. in the mind of, of the person. Uh, who's looking at the painting or listening to the music or reading the book. Yeah. And so I guess I just had to find that right outlet. And uh, so it turns out that words were, were uh, you know, and don't ask me to write with a pen. <laughs> I can type, but my handwriting, it was the lowest grade I, I got in elementary school, <laughs> C minus. So that should have been uh, a hint about my ability to paint. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Well, thank you so much again for coming. For those of you that, you. Um, for those of you that would like a, a book sign, to have them at the at the desk, you can purchase them there. And I will be over here at this table to sign them for you if you want that.